The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is brought to you by Clinica Sierra Vista. Welcome back to the 17 News at Sunrise podcast, where we share your news on your schedule. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. Good morning here at 5 a.m. Thanks for waking up with us on a Wednesday. I'm Maddie Jansen alongside Alex Fisher. We begin with breaking news from overnight. A homicide investigation has been launched in a neighborhood in Lamont. Deputies and detectives on scene last night on Camino La Jolla. They say they arrived shortly after 8 and found a man who had been shot to death. That's all we know so far. The investigation is ongoing. This morning we are officially on verdict watch. One of the most closely watched trials in Kern County history is now in the hands of the jury. Closing arguments wrapped up yesterday in the murder trial of Trezell and Jacqueline West. That's the couple charged with killing their two adopted boys, Orrin and Orson, months before reporting them missing back in December 2020. Prosecutors told the jury Trezell and Jacqueline West are adept at telling lies. Ultimately, they said the West's four other children unraveled their parents' scheme. When police interviewed the children the day after Orrin and Orson were reported missing, they all said the same thing. They hadn't seen their brothers for weeks. However, attorneys for Trezell and Jacqueline West said police focus on the couple from the very beginning, ignoring other possibilities. They say police did not look into the dozens of sex offenders living in California City and that more DNA testing and fingerprint evidence should have been collected. We are not claiming that aliens came down and abducted these children. That would be unreasonable, even if you were someone that believed in aliens. That would be an unreasonable theory. But that is not what we are saying. We are saying that, honestly, anything could have happened, right? They were abducted. I, I, we don't know. And to be quite honest, if we knew the answers to that, we really wouldn't even be here. Things that are done. Again, it's The jury will return to the courtroom for deliberations later today. Now, and now to our ongoing coverage of the deadly fentanyl crisis, sweeping our nation and destroying lives right here in Kern County. A 28-year-old woman will spend time behind bars for the death of a 16-year-old girl. She's accused of sharing fentanyl with the teen, resulting in a deadly overdose. 17's Marco Torres reports. Marilyn Elliott was sentenced to two years in prison. During the sentencing, she was with her friend, who later told us that the real criminal wasn't Elliott, but instead fentanyl. Judge Tiffany Organ Bowles said it wasn't just one life that was taken, but two. You insisted in the taking one, and you ruined your own because you're going to go to prison today. According to police reports, in May 2020, Marilyn Elliott was smoking fentanyl when a 16 year old Shayla Woolley asked her to share. Elliott says initially she refused to, but eventually let Shayla take a hit. Woolley's mother found the teen dead in her bedroom the next day. A family attorney read their statement in court, which said this crime has brought division, heartache and anger to the family. The death of Shayla has changed our family for the worse. Marilyn deserves life in prison. Elliot's friend, who she recently met in rehab, spoke on her behalf. Marilyn was nothing like a drug dealer, anything like that. You know, I think this is a little harsh. I'm sorry for their loss. So is she, but she's a good girl. Fentanyl's the killer here. James McLean, Elliot's friend, says addicts shouldn't be held to the same level as a drug dealer. I wish there was something that an addict is not held accountable for a drug dealer. Every, every addict, every addict suffers. McLean said staying away from fentanyl is one lesson everyone can take away from this case. Quit messing with that. That stuff will kill you. One hit will kill you. Why would you do that? Life's too beautiful. Marco Torres, 17 News. And the government default deadline is quickly approaching. Negotiators are striking a more optimistic tone, but deep divisions remain. NBC's Bree Jackson is in Washington this morning with the very latest. A new sense of urgency to prevent an unprecedented and potentially catastrophic government default. President Biden cutting short his overseas trip. I'm postponing the Australia portion of the trip and my trip to my stop in Papua New Guinea uh, in order to be back for the final negotiations with congressional leaders. The president's change in plans follows the second round of debt talk negotiations in the last two weeks. The administration and Republicans hinting at some progress and showing agreement on at least one thing. We know we're not going to default. 
They know it. We know it. Default is not an option. It would tip the country into a recession and cost us millions of jobs. Uh, the president simply won't allow that to happen. But the two sides remain far apart on certain issues. We've got to find a way that we can curve our spending, raise our debt limit, and uh, also grow our economy. Republican demands include work requirements for federal aid programs, something Democrats strongly oppose. Negotiators are staring down a June 1st debt default deadline. We have to proceed with the fierce urgency of now in order to make sure we can reach that bipartisan, common sense, common ground agreement. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says it's possible a deal could come by the end of the week. And the White House appointed OMB Director Shalanda Young and Senior Advisor Steve Reschetti to continue talks with Speaker McCarthy's office during President Biden's overseas trip. In Washington, Bree Jackson, NBC News. Also making headlines around the nation, House Democrats are pushing for a special resolution to force disgraced Republican George Santos from Congress. The move triggers a vote within the next two days, unless... Speaker McCarthy gets Republicans to refer Santos to the House Ethics Committee. A vote to oust Santos needs a two-thirds majority to pass. Santos has been indicted by the Justice Department on charges of money laundering, theft of public funds, and lying to Congress. He has pleaded not guilty. Can we continue our coverage of the Sierra Snowmelt? An incredible new video of our historic snowpack. As beautiful as it is, it is starting to melt, creating a major flood risk across California and, of course, here in Kern County. NBC's Steve Patterson with more on an urgent new effort to track the danger from the air. From 23,000 feet, it feels like an expanse of the Arctic Circle. But this is modern-day California. All this snow, a rare sight, high above the Sierra Mountains. Absolutely remarkable, the coating of the snowpack across the mountains or something out of Star Wars. It's a result of the state's weather whiplash. More than 30 back-to-back -back atmospheric rivers, flipping the threat from historic drought to historic flood risk. 55 billion tons of snow, enough to fill every major state reservoir twice. For football fans, you could fill the Rose Bowl about 85,000 times. Wow. Snow scientist and pilot Thomas Painter has been tasked with leading aerial expeditions above the snowpack, collecting sophisticated first-of-its-kind data using high-tech sensors. Our information gives the complete picture over the mountain basin. So again, we're, we're touching every square foot of snowpack with our lasers and spectrometers. The goal, to give local water districts a much better model of the snowpack, previously only possible through simplistic measurements, so the state has a better idea of when and where flooding could occur, as temperatures rise and the snow melts, posing a huge risk to millions in low-lying communities. Climatologists say no matter what, the snowpack will lead to flooding in California. There's simply too much water. How much and where really depends on the weather. An early heat wave could cause a lot of trouble. Firefighters had to bust out some chainsaws and other tools to get a fire, get to a fire inside a house in Central Bakersfield. You can see crews cutting through the roof with that chainsaw. This was yesterday morning on V Street. We've yet to hear from the city fire department detailing what started the fire or if anyone was hurt. Fire crews responded to a large vegetation fire in South Bakersfield last night. Take a look at this. This all started around 5 o'clock near South MLK Boulevard in East Casa Loma Drive. Residents say they saw the thick plumes of smoke miles away. We've reached out to the Kern County Fire Department for more information on how the fire started. How many acres burned? We have not heard back, though, as of news time. Your time now is 533. Video of a violent encounter between an accused domestic abuser and Bakersfield police has gone viral. It sparked allegations of excessive force and calls for an investigation. Well, now the police department has released body camera footage of the arrest. We're also learning the suspect's name, 41-year-old Jason Crawford. 17th Michaela Armstrong has been looking into this story for two days, and she has the latest, but we want to warn you, the video may be disturbing. Officers had been called to an apartment near Memorial Hospital on the afternoon of May 5th. A woman had reported Crawford was under the influence of methamphetamine and had attempted to stab someone with a pen. Sir, yeah. put the pen down. <laughs> 
A fight between Crawford and at least four officers started in the apartment. Come on. Relax. Put the phone down. I didn't do nothing. Relax. But spilled onto the second floor balcony. Passers-by on Q Street saw the end of the fight and videotaped the officers struggling with Crawford. One officer is seen inflicting full-string baton strikes on him. That passerby video began to go viral last week, and by Monday, community activists were calling for answers. It broke my heart when I saw that video. I immediately prayed for him, for his family, and I prayed for our city because this has to stop. We cannot have a law enforcement that does this to the community. A police spokesperson refused to comment on the community concerns Monday and Tuesday until Tuesday afternoon, five minutes after KGET ran a story on the passerby video and the community questions. That's when BPD released the body cam video that showed the beginning of the fight, including Crawford's apparent assault on the woman. It is apparent in the video that Crawford is a big man. In that video, officers attempt to calm him and then tase him once, twice, three times, and then a fourth time, apparently with little effect. <laughs> After Crawford is seen grabbing the woman in a chokehold, the fight moves to the balcony where officers wrestle him to the deck. This is the part of the fight the Q Street passerby saw. Crawford refused to let his hands be cuffed. One officer punches Crawford several times. Another swings his baton, striking Crawford on the back of his legs. <laughs> Blood is seen on Crawford and on the deck. Ultimately, Crawford is handcuffed and the video abruptly ends. A caption on the screen says, quote, no further force was used. As the video ends, Crawford is face down, handcuffed behind his back and loudly moaning. <laughs> BPD says Crawford is in the hospital in stable condition. His family says he is in Kern Medical Center and is in a coma. A family friend showed KGET photos of a man in a hospital bed apparently intubated. The man has multiple facial bruises and stitches. Michaela Armstrong, 17 News. Kern County is racing to meet a July 1st deadline to comply with a state law that seeks to drastically cut the amount of organic waste going into our landfills. That means you could soon see a higher trash fee to the tune of a few hundred dollars a year. 17's Maddie Gannon reports. As lawmakers in California look to cut greenhouse gas emissions, Kern County is pushing forward with a plan to implement a three-cart trash system in all of Kern to meet a state mandate of reducing organic waste in landfills by 75% in 2025. The lowest cost overall was to have what we have in Bakersfield and I've had for years and years, the three-cart system, so that each resident can put their organics in the green cart, the recyclables in the blue cart, and the remainder of those materials in the brown cart. Current Public Works Manager Chuck McGee explains, to facilitate this collection, the county is proposing a new fee for property owners, which the board is expected to consider next week. McGee says haulers in each area of Kern submitted what this trash collection would cost, resulting in a proposed fee of $559 for property owners in eastern Kern, $528 in western Kern, and $368 in Bakersfield, which McGee says is lower for a reason. They've been paying that for a long time, so the trucks have been paid for, the trash cans have been paid for, they've got a better deal because they've been paying it for the last 20 years, as with the other haulers that have to add all that to be able to do the services. The proposal caused a stir at a recent meeting in the Kern River Valley, where residents spoke out in protest, and it comes as the county, the board, and Kern's Public Works Department are being sued for previous fees approved by the board to comply with different aspects of the same law. Basically, what the county is doing is passing its responsibility to comply with that mandate onto residential taxpayers. And that's not right. Um, and that's exactly why Prop 218 exists. 
Ryan Christ is an attorney at Paris Law Firm, one of the firms bringing the case on behalf of a Kern resident. Proposition 218 restricts local government's ability to impose taxes without voter consent. Christ argues the fees violate the state constitution in Prop 218 by imposing a general tax increase without voter approval and using fees for projects outside of compliance with the state law. Maddie Gannon, 17 News. The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is a production of KGET and Nexstar Media Group. For more on all of the headlines in today's show, head to KGET.com.